did you hear what I said just now? Or? <laughs> okay. So we have four speakers today. First speaker, Anthony Morgan from Australian Institute of Criminology on does CCTV help police solve crime? Please join me in welcome Anthony. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for choosing this, this session to attend. Um, I know the, the competition is fierce at these conferences, so I appreciate you, you choosing us over the other side. Um, and I um, also want to take the opportunity to thank Vox. There's a lot of echo. Am I sounding okay? Um, yeah? Okay, cool. Um, so I also want to take, uh, thank uh, Boxer for the opportunity to present. I, I think these uh, conferences are always excellent. I learn a lot, really enjoy it, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm going to be speaking about some AIC research looking at the use and impact of CCTV. Um, before I do that, I want to acknowledge my co-contributors on this research who are here in the audience, uh, Chris Dowling, Alex Giannone, uh, and Penny Jorner. Um, and I also want to take the opportunity to acknowledge Sydney Trains, who we've been working very closely over a few years um, in, on this research, um, New South Wales Police Force, who have participated as, um, and provided data, and also the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Stats for, for providing data, um, which we always rely very heavily on and are grateful for. Um, so most of the research that has been undertaken to date on CCTV has focused on the crime prevention effects, um, so looking at whether it works to, to prevent or reduce crime. Um, and now this research is really important, um, and, and as far as physical crime prevention goes, it's probably one of the best evaluated um, um, prevention measures. Um, we don't know a whole lot around the investigative benefits of, of CCTV. Um, and this is despite there being significant investment, not just installing cameras, often sometimes for the reason of preventing crime, sometimes for the reason of assisting police, but there's also a significant back-end investment in storing footage, um, establishing infrastructure to enable sharing of information, um, and, and, and generally supporting um, access to footage for, for police. Um, so while the research around crime prevention effects of CCTV may be very useful in terms of helping to target where CCTV should be installed, um, the research around investigative benefits may help um, not just target those systems, but also assist in the design and management of them. So a few years ago, we conducted a, a national survey of local councils on their use of CCTV, um, and what we found was that there was a significant increase in the proportion of councils um, that had installed CCTV, something like a six-fold increase over two years. Um, and when we asked councils about their perceived benefits of the systems they'd installed, they rated helping police to identify and apprehend offenders as being um, more important or, or as having a greater impact than other potential outcomes. Um, and a significant proportion, around one in five, reported providing footage to police on a weekly basis, uh, sorry, on a um, yeah, weekly basis, two in five on a monthly basis. And of those who had provided footage, around 60% uh, reported that police had used that footage to apprehend an, um, an offender. Now, when you actually dug a little deeper in the qualitative responses, it was very apparent that there was limited information sharing between police and councils, and so these were pretty subjective assessments um, around the benefits. Uh, there has been limited research looking at the impact of CCTV on um, crime clearance or, or the use by police. Um, perhaps the best evidence comes from a fairly recent UK study uh, by Matt Ashby, uh, published in 2017, which looked at 250,000 uh, crime incidents on the British railway network um, and the use of CCTV. And what they, he found was that footage was available to investigators in half of all incident types, or half of all recorded incidents, um, and it was useful in two-thirds of those incidents where it was available, which is about one third of all criminal incidents on the, on the British Transport Network. Now, we know that the British Transport Network is quite unique in terms of the level of coverage. You've probably all heard how, how many cameras or the sort of level of saturation um, that, that exists in terms of camera footage. Um, and there's some Swedish research that suggests that the results may not be as positive if you look at open areas uh, where the level of camera is, is, is not as um, um, high. Um, so Kingren and Markland found that police sought access for one in eight um, sought access to footage for one in eight incidents in two nighttime entertainment precincts, and that it was useful in one in four cases. So the, um, both the access and, and, I guess, usefulness of the footage was, was lower in those, those areas. So given this limited international research and, and next to no um, Australian research on specifically on investigations, we, we approached this with, with four particular research questions. Uh, first, how often do police request CCTV footage from cameras located in public areas? What factors influence the likelihood that police will request CCTV footage? 
why do police request CCTV footage and how do they actually use the footage that's provided to them, and then what impact does that footage have on, on crime clearance outcomes? Um, now, we've been very fortunate, as I said at the beginning, to work with Sydney Trains, and, and this research focuses specifically on um, CCTV footage use for criminal incidents on the New South Wales Rail Network. Um, they have uh, something like 300 stations in the metro and intercity network. They have was 11,000 cameras. I think, it's, I think I heard recently it's up to 13,000 cameras across that network. Um, and they have a very strong relationship with the New South Wales Police Transport Command where they share information and share footage. Um, the, the, they also have a system in place which allows police to actually submit requests for footage and for Sydney trains to provide that footage back to them quite promptly. Um, and so we're able to capitalise on that data, um, and I'll talk about other data sources, um, to answer our research questions. And it took place in three studies. The first was an analysis of 10,000 police requests for footage in a one-year period back in 2014, um, and also looking at security incident data. The second study were, was um, based on interviews with 146 randomly selected investigators um, who had requested footage from Sydney trains. And then finally, we compared match cases with and without CCTV footage um, using linked data from the Bureau on crime clearance outcomes. And so what I want to do is I really want to just provide a high level, fairly high level overview and, and, and dig a little deeper into some of these studies um, to present overall findings. So first, looking at police requests for New South Wales rail network footage. Um, as I said, there were 10,000 requests um, in 2014 from, um, from Sydney trains. 59% of those requests were from New South Wales police. Others came from government agencies, um, uh, people using the network, um, and also there were internal requests from within Sydney trains for operational reasons. So 6,300 requests were made by police, um, and 78% of those related to crime, criminal justice, and antisocial behaviour. And contrary to um, some recent reporting, there's actually very good reason police request footage for non-criminal matters. Um, specifically, they do a lot of welfare checks and missing person investigations, um, which are quite obviously prominent on, on public transport networks. Um, but this equates to about 14 requests for, for CCTV footage from Sydney trains for criminal investigations per day. So there appears to be, appears to be a pretty significant demand. Um, outside of a general category, so this was using Sydney Trains data, it's not crime data, outside of a general category of police inquiry, the most common types of incidents for which um, footage was requested were assault, robbery, graffiti and malicious damage, so property damage, um, and, and theft. Um, and when you looked at the incident ratio of incidents to request, the rate of requests for violent crimes was, was higher than for property crimes, so more serious crimes, which is probably not surprising. But actually, what was also interesting is that the rate of requests varied by station, um, holding um, incident numbers uh, constant. So there was something different between stations in terms of the rate of, um, of, of, of footage request. And so we wanted to look at this um, by determining, I guess, the, the impact not just of incidents, but also passenger footfall, the number of cameras, um, and also some, um, I guess, design or station characteristics around whether it was an interchange, um, how accessible the station was, and also its elevation. So we use, and I'll, I'll walk through this part relatively quickly, but we use zero inflated negative binomial regression, um, predicting the number of requests per station, which allows us to work out the, I guess, the independent effect of each of these variables controlling for, for all others. Um, incident rate ratios, is, it, they're pretty easy to in, um, interpret. Um, higher than one means more requests, um, and it's, it, as you can see, the, the, the interpretation of those ratios is relatively straightforward. Um, and when we looked first at all stations, so all 300 stations, um, we found that all four of these variables were significant predictors of the number of requests. Um, metro stations received twice as many requests, holding the number of incidents um, uh, constant compared to, to intercity or regional stations. Uh, the number of security incidents, not surprisingly, was a significant predictor. The number of cameras was a significant predictor of the number of requests. So for every 10 cameras, there was a 5% increase in the number of requests. Um, but footfall was actually a negative predictor. So the more footfall, so the more average daily uh, number of the passengers going through barriers, um, the, the um, higher the number of requests, which we put down to um, a relationship with passive surveillance. So fewer potential witnesses um, possibly means police are more likely to request footage for incidents. We were able to then unpack this a little further, looking at metropolitan stations only, where we had um, design uh, characteristics of the actual station. So whether it was an interchange, as I said, whether it was an interchange, whether it was accessible 24 hours a day, um, and also whether part of the station was underground or elevated. And we were trying to understand further this, this issue around passive surveillance and its role in, in footage requests. 
Um, what we found running the same sort of um, the same approach in terms of the, the analysis was that um, the number of security incidents was still a significant predictor of the number of footage requests, but actually ex being accessible after hours and being an, inter uh, an interchange um, uh, resulting in a significantly higher number of requests for stations. Um, and we think probably that the, the interchange is the fact that you've got people coming together, um, perhaps in crowded spaces, they're possibly using parts of a station which are not as well surveilled, pedestrian tunnels and other things, um, and they're possibly qualitatively different incidents. So we were looking specifically, I forgot to mention, we were looking specifically at assault incidents, and it's possible that you've got alcohol-related assaults adjacent to entertainment precincts, possibly more severe, and perhaps that means they're more likely to request footage. Um, similarly, accessible after hours is probably because you've got incidents that are occurring after hours when there's fewer people around, so it kind of makes sense. Uh, the number of cameras was no longer significant, which we put down to probably the fact that there's pretty blanket coverage of metropolitan stations. Um, they're probably, I would argue, just about at the point of saturation. There's not a lot um, that can be done to kind of increase the, the coverage of, of stations, uh, particularly busier stations. Okay, so I just want to move to, to the second study then. So we start to see some patterns in terms of high levels of demand and perhaps some variation in terms of where police are more likely to request footage. So we wanted to look next at, well, why do police request footage and is it useful? Demand might be high, but do they actually value it? So what we did is we randomly selected 250 uh, investigators who had requested footage from Sydney trains um, and we approached them to participate in an interview. Um, 146 agreed to participate, which is a response rate of about 60%. Um, most of those who didn't respond, we couldn't contact. Actually, only 19 police officers refused to participate, which is an incredible response rate, and we've, um, there's probably something in that in terms of their views around CCTV. Um, but when asked why they requested footage, 80% said they had requested footage to identify or confirm the identity of a suspect. So that was the primary reason for which they were, were requesting the footage, but also to determine whether an offence was had actually occurred, um, and to corroborate statements were also um, common reasons for requesting that footage. Um, I also should have mentioned this is looking at assault, sexual assault, robbery, property damage and theft offences, so we had a kind of stratified random sampling um, method. For the purpose of today, I just want to compare um, the intended with actual use. Um, there's a lot more, and, and, and I'll talk about this later, but there's a lot more um, that we've looked at with these, this survey data. But we wanted to see, well, what was the difference between the re reason they requested footage and, and the information they'd actually received. And you can see, not surprisingly, police weren't able or always able to use the footage for the reason they'd requested it. Um, so uh, particularly around half were still able to use the footage to identify or confirm the identity of a suspect. So that's still fairly, fairly high. Um, but you see an increase on the right-hand side where um, police who couldn't use it for one of their sort of main reasons still reported using it for intelligence or investigative leads, which is something we've observed in some other um, research into investigations. Um, but what this means overall is amongst these investigators, 87% were able to use the footage in some way for their invest investigation. 62, so 62%, two, two-thirds, um, used the footage for its intent, one of the intended reasons, so one of the intended, the reasons they'd actually requested the footage. 46%, um, as I said, of investigators used the footage to identify or confirm the identity of, identity of a suspect. Um, and 71% of investigated rate, investigators rated the footage as useful or very useful for the incident they were currently investigating. So we seem to have evidence of a high level of demand for footage and police seem to value it. Um, but does that actually transfer into uh, improvement in crime clearance rates? Now, we were able to link our data on footage requests with New South Wales Bureau of Crimes, that's crime incident data and, crime and data on um, crime clearances. And we did that using the COPS event number. So we had um, uh, we started about 31,000 incidents over a four year, of criminal matters, sorry, over a four year period. Um, we excluded those matters um, that had been solved or cleared on the same day because there's little opportunity for CCTV to be used other than perhaps for other reasons. We were interested in whether an offender had been proceeded against. Um, and we ended up with about 23,000, 24,000 criminal incidents. Uh, footage had been requested, for, I think, for about 27% of those incidents, so about 6,500 um, incidents, um, and had been provided to police in about 90% of the incidents that, for which they'd actually requested the footage. So there's some vetting that goes on by Sydney trains, but actually when they get requested, they have footage that's requested, they pretty much provide it to New South Wales Police and, 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 and rely on them to, to, to review that footage. So we have incidents where footage has been requested, or criminal matters where footage has been requested, 
where it's been requested and provided and where it hasn't been requested. Now, we can't just compare that. You've heard everybody so far talking about uh, causality and, and needing to account for selection bias, but obviously that's, a, that's an issue here. So we would naturally expect police to be requesting footage for certain types of incidents rather than other types of incidents. There's going to be some sort of bias. Um, and there's, there's various reasons that we, we might think that that is. Um, it might be that there's certain aspects of the, the offence. Um, there might be certain other types of evidence, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the limits of the analysis um, in relation to that. Um, but what we did was we first had to say, well, okay, well, what differs between those incidents for which police had and hadn't requested footage? And there were some fairly significant differences. Um, the most significant related to offence type. Um, so there were fairly significant differences in the rate of footage requests for different types of offences. Um, assault, around 50% of criminal matters resulted in a footage request. In robbery, it was something like 70% of criminal incidents. Um, and then for you know, public disorder, it's closer to 3 or 4% of criminal incidents. So there was, that was kind of the, the most significant um, a factor in determining whether police requested footage. But it also varied by time of day, day of week, um, uh, the time window, so whether, it occurred, whether the person who reported it said it occurred with, at this specific time versus it was in the eight hours my car was parked there. Um, and also the location, so whether it was in the station or on a train, and that's because there's differences in, in um, camera coverage in those locations. Um, importantly, and the thing that we thought was most important here was the severity of the offence. So what we did was we created a severity index, which is essentially like an, um, an adjusted, adjusted equivalent custodial sentence for all of the crimes um, that occurred as part of a matter. So we essentially took the average custodial sentence, um, computer, turned that into number of days or number of months, and then developed, uh, estimated the, the total kind of custodial length for that type of offence or those type of offences together. And not surprisingly, more serious offences were more likely to result in a request for footage. And that's how we tried to account for some of that, that issue around investigative effort, which I'll, I'll come back to. So we needed to account for those differences between um, um, requests or incidents with a request and incidents without a request. Um, what we did is we used statistical matching, um, plenty of discussion of that at this conference already. We used nearest neighbour matching, um, and we used the TFX command within STATA. Um, there's a good reason we used near, nearest neighbour as opposed to something like propensity score matching, although at an aggregate level they produced almost identical results. And that was because we wanted to be able to exact match, particularly on offence type, but on, on other offence characteristics. What nearest neighbour matching does is essentially um, you have your actual clearance rate for an incident, and then you um, estimate a predicted clearance rate for similar, the average um, clearance rate for similar matters in the control group, um, which are based on, the, I guess it's kind of like a weighted um, estimate of the, the distance between those matters across all of the covariates included in the matching process. So um, we used one-for-one uh, -one matching um, with a caliper of 0.02, um, and we used width replacement. Um, now, I won't go into detail. The reason that's important is because uh, as I mentioned, some incident types, there were more requests than there were incidents without requests, right? So we had a, a limited selection of, of incidents um, from which to draw our control group. Um, and that that's actually really important when it comes to trying to generalise these results to other incident types. So I'll just push the pointer, not the thing. OK, so these are the results. First, we compare um, incidents where there was a footage request with incidents where there was no footage request. This is about as close as we can get to kind of an intention to treat analysis. Um, doesn't take into account whether police received any footage, whether that footage was useful. Um, it simply says, well, when they requested the footage, um, was there a difference between um, those incidents in the likelihood an offender was proceeded against? Um, the results are actually really easy to interpret. Um, so the average treatment effect on the treated here, which is the coefficient of difference, the first line is 0.044. What that means is that there was a 4.4 percentage point difference in the clearance rate for incidents um, with and without a CCTV footage request, controlling for all of those variables I've talked about. So basically, there was a significant improvement in clearance rates for incidents with CCTV footage. We then looked at where footage had been requested and provided versus not requested, and this accounts for the fact that those cases where CCTV hadn't been received by police, um, and the effect was slightly larger. And that's because what actually we, is quite interesting is those cases where police had requested footage and not been provided the footage, they were less likely to clear the incident and by, uh, clear the matter and, and by some significant amount. And I'll, I'll come back to that point shortly. Um, but it, it appears to be a, a significant improvement um, in crime clearance rates. Now, just to put that into context, what that actually means 
is um, we can calculate the predicted clearance rate, so the predicted outcome, the estimated outcome for matters with and without a footage request. So comparing on the first on the left, footage request versus not request, those matters where footage was not requested, the clearance rate was estimated to be 20.2%. The clearance rate for matters where footage had been requested was 24.6%. That's across all incident types. And then when we look at the requested and provided uh, versus not requested, it's 27% versus 21.5%. So you can see the percentage point difference and how that applies to those estimates. Now, oh, yep, cool, okay. Um, so the, I mentioned the other reason we want to use nearest neighbor matching is because we were interested in the differences for different offense types. I think I mentioned it. If I didn't, I was supposed to. Um, we were then able to estimate essentially the clearance rates for different types of offenses. Um, and I focused here on assault, theft and burglary is kind of combined category and property damage because these collectively account for about 80% of all footage requests um, that were received in the period we were analyzing. And you can see there's some variation in effect size for um, property damage and um, theft relative to assault. So the, the, there's a, a bigger difference basically in clearance rates for, for those property related offenses. Um, and it's kind of consistent with what we might expect um, based on some of the crime prevention literature which says police, uh, police, um, offenders who are committing theft offences are perhaps more likely to be deterred by CCTV, they're perhaps more cautious about other witnesses, um, whereas assault is possibly more um, impulsive, people are more likely to be alcohol affected. So there's possibly more likely to be other forms of surveillance, other witnesses in assault cases versus um, theft and, and property damage. And that plays out actually in some of the, the interview data which I haven't talked about today. Now, I, before I go on and talk about the summary findings, I have to, of course, acknowledge the limitations, particularly with the last component of our study. Um, we can't control for investigative effort, um, and that's potentially a, um, you know, a, 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 an admitted variable that we just can't account for in terms of the differences between cases with and without footage. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons we would argue that that's perhaps not as big an issue as um, others might think it is. Um, one is that we have accounted for offence severity, which is actually a pretty, other research has shown, a pretty significant determinant in um, how much in, um, effort police invest in, in, in an investigation. Um, there's also research that shows investigative effort actually doesn't make a huge difference over and above crime scene evidence. Um, and then finally, we also noticed that CCTV footage is requested very early in the investigation process. Um, so it actually might be that CCTV is the trigger for investigative effort. Police might request footage, find no incident, or find no evidence, and go, well, there's probably not much I can do about that particular um, incident without any other witnesses available. Anyway, um, there's probably more limitations. I'm sure you'll point them out. Um, so just, just to summarize, I'm down to my last minute, so I'll just summarize the findings from across these three studies. Um, so first of all, rail network CCTV footage is frequently requested by police for the purpose of criminal investigations. Uh, when we looked overall, the number of incidents, the number of cameras um, and passenger footfall all appear to be pre predicted to the number of requests at different stations. Um, and when we look more specifically at metropolitan stations only, station design and the presence of other forms of surveillance um, seem to be important. Um, so that, that might tell us something about where we put cameras, right, for investigative purposes. So footage is used for its intended purpose. So when police make a lot of requests and it's used for its intended purpose in around two thirds of cases where it's available um, and appears to be valued and, and useful by, or used and valued by police. Um, and the availability of footage is associated with an increased likelihood of an offender being proceeded against. So some sort of action, legal action being taken against the offender. Um, but as I've also illustrated, access to footage um, is inconsistent across offense types and is not equally beneficial across an offense types. So that's also important. Oh, I've got 10 seconds left. So what does this mean? Well, first, CCTV systems should be targeted at locations where there's a higher concentration of incidents. That seems really obvious. I would argue that's not currently the case. But it's also important that we focus on incidents where there's more likely to result in requests for police or where police are more likely to benefit. And this is where you're installing camera systems for the purpose of benefiting police investigations. Um, and as I've um, tried to allude, um, it's imp particularly important in those locations where there's other forms of surveillance are less likely. Um, we need to, and I've kind of not really covered this in this, this presentation, but timeliness is important. Um, so we need to find ways to ensure that police have timely access to footage of criminal incidents. Um, and finally, it's worth commenting on the, the, the systems themselves. I'm certainly not suggesting that these results suggest you should um, expand CCTV everywhere and provide you know, super extreme coverage to benefit police. 
I suspect that these results would not be replicated if you were to look at open spaces, as we sh I showed with the Swedish example. Um, rail networks are quite unique in the level of coverage in the system, the level of resourcing, um, and, the and, the, and the kind of um, monitoring arrangements that exist. Um, but what this does show that is access to footage for investigative purposes requires resources, cooperation, and systems. The first of the three um, studies has been released, was released last year. The other two have been through peer review and hopefully will be released um, in the next few months. So thank you very much. Any questions for Anthony? Uh, one, two. Thank you for that. Um, quick question. Did you look at the Cabramatta study at all in any way, shape or form, or the work that was done in Cabramatta with CCTV over the 15 years or so? I appreciate this was focused at rail networks. Yeah, no, not specifically for this study. Hello. Um, my question is uh, in relation to the investigative process in um, investigators obtaining CCTV footage. Did you look at the actual process they undertake and what they do with it? Because you could kind of argue that investigative purposes and intelligence purposes are kind of one and the same thing at this point. Yeah, so, um, so we were looking at it specifically as it related to particular criminal incidents. Um, so when I say investigative or intelligence leads, it was in relation to kind of something that followed from that incident. Um, we, and they're also aggregated categories, so we, we actually kind of had sort of fairly qualitative responses and kind of aggregated to those major categories. Um, but yeah, so we don't, we didn't look at, well, had they requested the footage for um, a general, kind of general intelligence that had to be relating specifically to an offence. Is that what you mean? No, I mean, as in, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, probably not in the detail. We had about 10 minutes per officer, um, so we kind of asked some pretty structured questions around why they'd requested it, what footage that, what was in the footage that they'd received, um, what other evidence they had available to them, how they'd specifically used the footage, and then also some information about what had happened as part of the investigation in terms of the outcome of the investigation. I don't know, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question right, but um, I don't know if we would have picked up the sort of information I think you're alluding to. Oh, okay, so you say, yeah. Right, okay. No, we, we were specific, I mean, we were expecting the, I guess, the investigator, the lead investigator who had requested the footage to, I guess, answer on behalf of the investigation. So it wasn't specifically them, it was about the investigation. Sorry, that was a really simple answer to your question, I apologize. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of you saying the footage requested versus what was actually approved, were there any specific reasons given why footage wouldn't be approved or released? Because I guess I'm kind of thinking in the way, couldn't it then be subsequently subpoenaed and isn't that a waste of resources if it could have just yeah. been released? So um, we kind of touched on this in the first paper. There was um, Basically, they got to the point where um, there were so many requests for footage, they had to set some parameters. Um, so there has to be, um, I, I think, I can't remember the specifics of the rule, but it's essentially that um, the offence has to have occurred on rail network property. They can't just be looking for an offender who may have used the train, for example. Um, so that's one reason, that kind of is an initial filter. Um, but then there's a time limit, so there's minimum retention periods of 14 days for footage, so if you fall outside of that and the footage hasn't been retained, it's not available. Um, and then in some cases you have sort of proactive security officers who do a search or the police ask them to do a search and they'll, they'll report they didn't provide the footage and it's kind of a nil find, so there was no actual evidence of anything the investigator was looking for. Thank you very much. Cool.